Okay, welcome to Thursday, October 1. And uh, this is the concepts we're looking at today. And a question was put on the table about direct variation and indirect variation, or someone would call that direct variation. Bring a couple more people in the room. Inverse variation, joint variation, those are other words you hear. And I am trying to look those up because they're in a particular section in the book. And I want to make sure that I point this out. 3.8. So I will say a word about that very briefly, but hang on for a second. I'll get everybody else present. Um, I'm also going to log into the homework system just so I can show you something there if necessary. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Very good. So let's think about what we're going to do today. So we showed you some systems of linear equations on Tuesday. It's October 1st already, it's October. And we're gonna do some more examples today and some applications that might help you with your next written homework. And in particular, we're gonna show you the cases where something goes bad or something goes wrong. And the good news is those cases are entirely manageable. I don't know if I spelled manageable correctly. And the calculator can still back us up. The calculator can still recognize these unusual cases too. Still, still effective if you want me to say it like that. The calculator is still effective at doing those problems. <coughs> so we're gonna do some more calculator practice. And then we're going to shift to chapter four, which is introduction to polynomials. So I want to say, and this is where the variation almost fits in. So concept functions. And right now we've been doing four, one, four, two, four, three. Uh, this thing we're doing with systems of linear equations. That's in the book sections 4, 1, 4, 2, and 4, 3. Now the direct and indirect variation is in section 3, 8, which is technically not on our schedule. So it's not something that I assigned in the XYZ homework. It's possible though that you might have seen it in the chapter review. So I, where, where can I just ask were, Jacob, where did you come up with that idea? There were two about? questions in the XYZ homework about it. In what section? Uh, I will check real quick, one sec. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got to be really concerned about because uh, it should, there shouldn't be, except in section 3.8, and in the XYZ homework, I'm sure I excluded section 3.8. Let me double check. That's why I'm guessing you might have seen them in a chapter review. So that's, and, and bring it back to me when you see, when you find it, just bring it back to me where you saw it. And, and for that reason, I don't want you to worry about variation that 
it's not going to be something that I would cover. Uh, it was in the chapter not. three review. Good. Where did you see it? Uh, in the chapter three review, there were two questions on it. Okay, very good. Then let's handle it like this. I won't put it on a test because it's not on our syllabus. But if you're doing that problem in the chapter review or any problem you see in the chapter review you want to ask a question on, flag it and send me a question inside the chapter review at the forum. Some of you are sending me questions inside the system in the forums, and that's wonderful too. But I won't, uh, with your permission, I won't use the class time on it since it's not physically in our class. But if you flag it in the forum, I will answer the question there. And it's not a going to be a long or complicated answer. It's just, I want to accomplish some other things here today. That's uh, perfectly fine. I was just, we can skip it if you really think so. I was just wondering just because there are questions on it. Right. And I think that's the style of the chapter review. Don't, don't worry if you see something in chapter review that we didn't do. But I will answer that question there. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, any other questions people want to ask? I'll just write this down for people who are viewing this later. that you don't worry about that you miss covering it. Uh, and so uh, you're asking of a, a good question. The chapter reviews in XYZ homework are not counted for your homework grade. And your overall XYZ grade, because the XYZ homework just counts everything that you're doing in the class. Well, sure, I just lost a window, excuse me. The overall XYZ homework counts everything that you're doing inside their system. But if you look at your grade report that I'm giving you, I only am counting what you do in the sections that I said were assigned on our website. So Trevor's asking, does the chapter review count towards your grade? And the answer is no. I leave it turned on in there just in case you wanted more practice or other practice ahead of the test. So thank you, Trevor, good question. Okay, so uh, so this brings up other questions and I like that. Uh, so, you know, then the next actual question, of course, everybody's favorite question about any test is what's on the test. So remember the only things that are on the test are the sections we'll cover, but this is week five, next week is week six, test is week eight. Next week, we'll start to get more explicit, more direct about, you know, what kind of questions I like, what kind of questions I don't like. So questions about the test content. We will give you examples next week ahead of the test, you know, next week, week six, next week, week seven, we'll give you examples. The exam is week eight. Okay, very good, thank you very much. Okay, so linear questions, we'll throw a few more examples at you. We'll again demonstrate how the calculator works on these problems. 
and I will demonstrate a couple problems now where something goes wrong. And then you can recognize that. And when I say goes wrong, it doesn't mean failure and it doesn't mean you did something wrong. It would be more accurate for me to say, I'll show you the things that happen very rarely. Still, you need to know how to do them, but they just happen much more rarely. Okay, and this is still discussion in sections 4, 1, 4, 2, and 4, 3. And then we will open up chapter 5. And that's introducing discussion of polynomials. Now, I also, you know, you guys have various backgrounds, taken this course or that course. You may have taken courses before that have a lot of this stuff in it. And now maybe the only difference is in this class, you know, there's a homework, there's an objective grade, there's going to be a test. You're taking this course because for some reason you have to put this on your college record. And that could be for transferring, it could be for qualifying for another course, it could be for a graduation requirement. You all have a different need. But right now you need this course on your record and that you've taken it previously or that you've taken courses that have discussed some of these things previously previously that's not necessarily what's going to put it on your record here so i want to just say that i'm sensitive to the fact that you've done some of these things before and for you cases some of this might be review but i'm not trying to bore you and i'm not trying to disrespect that you hadn't learned it before I'm just saying at the end of the day, I got to put a test up. I got to put a grade down. And I'm just the next person in a, probably a long line of persons that you're going to have to prove yourself to. That's not a bad thing. That's not a threat. It's just right now that's a system. <laughs> like it or dislike it, that's the system. Sometimes. I don't like the system. Let's do an example from 4.3, because I think I can tell you all these things and give you the calculator practice also inside section 4.3. So I'm going to pull up a section 4.3. By the way, when you look at chapter 4, you will also see there's a section 4.4 4 called linear inequalities. That is also not on our schedule, but when you do the chapter four review, you might see questions about linear inequalities. You can do them or not do them as you like. But again, the chapter review will have everything that the book covers in a chapter, not everything that we do. Okay, so I'm going to pick out a problem in section four three, and then I'm gonna bring that to you on the screen and then we're going to do it with the methods we developed last time okay so i'm coming over here i'm gonna get the book ready and then show it on the screen to you i'm looking for section four three and Okay, that's interesting. I, I didn't turn on my whiteboard yet. Uh, I'm not going to unless we have a need for it. But, or you can log into the book if you have to log in the book. With the same username password that you use for the homework system. So I'm looking at section 4.3 applications, and let's just warm up on a mellow one, and then we'll try harder ones. I'm looking at this very, very mellow one. <laughs> let's, and, you, and you probably have seen problems like this before, and you say, what in the world? There is no practical need for this problem. But look at 25, just for fun. Bob's got 20 coins. They total $1.40. If he only has dimes and nickels, then how many of each does he have? We should be able to work that out. In fact, we should be able to work that out counting on our fingers and toes, probably. 
but I just want to use it as a way to practice solving linear systems. So how would I do this? And let's talk about, on the paper, I'll write this. I'll write down the problem that I'm referring to. Not the text of the problem, but I'll write down what problem number I'm referring to so you can follow it later. So what I have to do, remember what linear equations look like, you know, 2x minus 3y equals 6, x plus 4y equals 7, uh, 3x plus y minus z equals 2x minus 2y plus 3z equals 4, 3x minus y plus z equals 10. I'll pop back to my paper for a second. These are examples of linear equations. Here's two equations with two unknowns. Here's three equations with three unknowns. So what I need in this funny coin problem is to write it as one of these people, one of these things, because I got a machine for doing this stuff. I got a technique. Now, you look back at the problem and you start to suck information out of the problem, right? Dimes and nickels, 20 coins, dollar 40, how much of each? Do you start to say to yourself, well, what do I want to know? I want to know the number of dimes and nickels. Now you can use X's and Y's for that, but I just want you to be open-minded. You could use N and D. Let's let N be the number of nickels. Sometimes it helps to you choose a letter that represents what that thing means to you. Let's let D be the number of dimes. You could just as easily choose X and Y. And frankly, when I do it, I just usually, usually choose X and Y for uniformity. But do you see you've already discovered something important here? I'm looking for two unknowns. That means I am not doing this, three equations, three unknowns gone, I'm doing one of these. So already that's a victory. I want one of these. I need two equations, two unknowns. Okay, what do you know about the number of dimes and nickels? You know that together you've got 20 of them. N plus D equals 20. Okay, now I'm halfway home. I've got one equation with those two unknowns. I need another equation. You also know the value of each dime and the value of each nickel. So you could say, and you could do this in decimals or dollars, but you could say, I've got 140 cents. Or you could say, I've got a dollar 40, 1.40. I'm going to just say, because I like to avoid decimals when I can, I got 140 cents, dollar 40. And you know that each nickel is worth five cents. So how many nickels I got, I multiply by five, and that tells me how much money I got in nickels. Dimes are worth 10 cents. Then if I have seven dimes, I will have 70 cents. Now I've got the two equations and the two unknowns. And I'm gonna do this both by hand and calculator just to remind you of how to do it on the calculator. And in a sense, I'm trying to reassure you that the calculator's got your back, that you can use that to check things. Okay, let's do it the way we did it last time. Elimination, addition, substitution would also work, but I wanna practice the addition method, the elimination method, because those are the ones that are most powerful. So I'm gonna take here minus five times the first equation and the second equation. So minus five N, minus five D, minus 100. Multiply everybody by minus five first equation. Second equation, I'll leave alone. 140. Make sure you honestly multiply. That means correctly multiply. When I add them together, no ends. 
five Ds, and 140 plus minus 100 is 40. Now that tells me that dividing by five, I must have eight dimes. The number of dimes must be eight. And that makes 80 cents. Now I could use that in any number of ways to find the number of nickels, right? And I will appreciate if you think this is overkill now, but I'm gonna practice the other elimination. Minus 10 times one. Leave the second equation alone. Minus 10n minus 10d equals minus 200. And second equation as is, 5n plus 10d equals 140. That immediately tells me the number of nickels. I add together no dimes, minus five times n, the number of nickels, and minus 200 plus 140 is 60, minus. And that means that n, when I divide negative five into negative 60, I get 12. And that's 12 nickels, which thankfully is 60 cents. I did this little safety check on the side here to make sure, did I add up to 140 cents? The answer is yes, I did. Okay, remember, these are word problems. What's the last command in a word problem? Answer the question the way it was asked in English. So I'm referring to the question. And this is where you can get tricked, but it says how many of each coin does he have? Don't write a novel, just write the facts. Bob has eight dimes and five nickels. But always answer the question that was asked. Wait a minute, something is smelling really bad to me. What is it? <laughs> what did I do wrong? Exactly. Okay, good. Would you see how easy it is to write something silly? In my head, nickels, nickels, five, five, five. Okay, five nickels. But do you see how easy it was to check too, by the way? I said eight times five nickels. I was about to tell you how proud it was because he used 13 coins. But I didn't have 13 coins. I knew that. So let's make the fix. I don't have to... Just, you know, gently cross something out. Don't hack it out. Just say 12 nickels. Okay, now I feel better. I do have my 20 coins. Check. I do have $1.40. Check. Okay, now let's pop to the calculator. Uh, maybe I'll use both calculators today. Maybe I'll use the color calculator too. Just, I don't know what you guys have or use. So. The part about this one I don't like is that reflective screen. But let's see if I can bring it up. I mean, it's so reflective. That's funny. You see my finger and you see my phone hanging in the air <laughs> that I use as the document camera. That doesn't terribly well help it. You know what I should do is get some kind of shade above that light. Wow, okay, that's a process improvement. Okay, I'll try that. But I can't do that right now because I'd be holding it in midair. I'll work on that idea. So anyway, where is the matrix key? Fifth row, first button, second function matrix. Edit the matrix. And what matrix do I want to create? I guess I should say that before I type it in, right? I want to think of this system as Six numbers, one nickel, one dime, sorry, at one N, one D, 20 coins, five Ns, 10 D, 140 cents. So you see that this 
things, thing called matrix, is just the core information. Who cares whether I call them N's and D's or X's and Y's or P's and Q's? That's not important. But you can imagine a little divider there. These are the numbers of nickels. This column represents nickels. This column represents dimes. This column represents the constants. This is how I type it into calculator. Maybe I'll use that shade later. I want a matrix. Can you show how to get to that again on the calculator, like the Good. graph and the chart? Absolutely. That's right. So thank, thank you for thank you for doing that because that I want you to interrupt like that. Uh, on a TI-84, regardless of what version you have, it is right down here. And if I hold that up closer, you see the word matrix. And so let's try to do this sometimes with this calculator. Do you see that that's in the fifth row in the first button? So sometimes I say that, but I say it too quick. Go to the fifth row first button. But it's the blue thing, so I need this blue second key. So go second function, matrix, and then you'll get to that screen. And your question is important because of the fact that this calculator has so many more things than show up on the keyboard. So you gotta know where to find these menus. So it's really important that you ask that question. Okay, now I will edit the matrix and I will hold a paper between me and the light above to help block the paper. Edit the matrix. Let's put it in matrix A. I don't mind which one I use, but I want matrix A to be what? According to this piece of paper, I want matrix A to be two rows and three columns. So I just type two, enter, three, enter. Now I'll bring this closer to the camera again, but now I see two rows and three columns. Now I just type in the numbers one after the other with the enter key. One enter, one enter, 20 enter. And it goes down to the next row. Five enter, 10 enter, 140 enter. Now I'm gonna bring it up closer. You see that I've got that matrix in there, what I want. And now what I'll do and this is another good lesson in calculator use. I'm gonna get out of the matrix menu. So you dig into a menu, right? And then you gotta get out. And when you wanna get out of a screen or menu, you do second function quit. The quit is in the second row, second button, but it's blue, so you do second function quit. Now, I want to look at that matrix I just typed. So second function matrix, what is its name? Its name is A. A is highlighted, I just hit enter. And I'm literally here asking the calculator, what is matrix A? I just wanna make sure I typed it right or else everything I did was worthless. I did type it right compared to what I wanted on my paper, right? Now let's try again. We want to have the calculator do what we just did by hand. That is totally gut this matrix until I see the X and Y or here the N and D. And remember that was called row reduced echelon form. So you go second function matrix and matrix is this key down here, fifth row first button. And uh, you go to math, because you're gonna do math now, and then you slide down to find that special key, reduced row echelon form. Or R, R, E, F. And that's the addition method key, or the, the elimination method key, any way you wanna say it. So I'm gonna take that thing, and I'm gonna put the A right in there. Second function, matrix, name A, close parentheses, and pop. Now, I gotta interpret this still. 
But this is the answer I expected, isn't it? The first column was nickels. Second column was D, dimes. So the first row says, I have one N and no Ds is 12. That means N is 12. Second row says no Ns and one D is eight. That means D is eight. So the calculator agrees with me that I had eight dimes and 12 nickels. Doesn't matter whether I say I have eight dimes and 12 nickels or 12 nickels and eight dimes. I could say that in either order. But what's very important for me, and that's why I chose a basic question to begin with, is that I can do it by hand, I can do it on the calculator, I don't have any doubt that I did it right, and I don't want you to have any doubt that you did it right on an exam or homework. Okay, excellent. Now let's also make this really clear. For that reason, if you just show me the picture of your calculator on the test or on the homework, I give you zero points. The homework question is going to be written the test question is gonna be written. It says, like the book, show me how to do this. And then I need to see this. Or as you asked a question last time, I need to see you find one of them and substitute back to find the other. I don't mind how you do that, but I need to see your work. And the reason is I'm not giving a grade to your calculator. And I already know the calculator has the answer in it. So this is kind of really practical. If you want the grade, you show me the work. The calculator's purpose is that you know you are right. That's all that I want you to think about that. I want you to know you're right. And I want you to learn this process. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now let's try, maybe let's try a harder one. Two by two, let's do three by three. Let me check this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so Jacob asked an important question. How do I know I entered the question correctly? And that is really what I did right here. Ah, sorry. Where is my, I need an umbrella. That's what I need. I'll go to my garage and get an umbrella next time. I mean, you never think about what a photographer does, do you? Or do you know that there are such things as photographers? Photographers got these fancy lights, fancy shades. But nowadays, where are 99%? Well, it's easily 95% of all pictures are taken what? On your phone. I mean, I know photographers literally been put out of business because everybody takes pictures on their phone. Okay. How do I know I entered the equation correctly? That's this A right here. These numbers, 1, 1, 20, 5, 10, 140, they have to match the problem that I created. So did I do the equation correctly and enter it into the calculator? Yes, I entered what I created. In that sense, Jacob's question is more important. How do I know I created the questions correctly? How do I know I created these correctly? Well, that's what you're being paid money for. Well, you're being paid points, not money. You have to know that you wrote these equations correctly. And the only protection for that is your logical thinking. You're absolutely right. If you type in the wrong problem, it won't matter that the calculator did it correctly. So you have to create the problem correctly. And this is not stupid. You have to make sure you enter it correctly because sometimes you misenter the numbers. I do. So now your question is, how do I know I have created this correctly? And then I just have no protection. I have no protection whatsoever, except that I know what these symbols mean and I read the problem correctly. So uh, that's how I take your question. Uh, not that did I enter it in the calculator correctly, but that's important. How do you know you created the correct thing? That is, I got bad news for you in a sense. That is on you. 
Now, there are some things you can do. See, that's the safety checks at the end. You could say, if I screwed up these, my answer wouldn't make sense to the problem. And remember, the problem said you had 20 coins. So that's why I checked myself. Do I have 20 coins? Yes, I do. And when I wrote that five there, I knew I screwed up. The problem said I had $1.40. Do I have $1.40? 80 plus 60 is $1.40. Yes, I do. And then I have much, much more confidence in what I wrote here. So here's another answer to your question. It's a good answer. I really don't have confidence in what I wrote unless it gives me an answer that makes sense. Uh, and if you think about it, that's what you need. You need to have confidence that your answer made sense. Let's try another one. And dirty paper here and there. I'm trying to read clean paper. But let's try another one that's not, that's a little busier. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Yeah, let's do one with percentages. Let's do one with decimals. Let's do a messy thing. And I could go down to 14. <coughs> Excuse me. I go down to 20. 20 is one that really gives people fits. 14 or 20. Which one should we choose? Let's choose 20. because this is a style of problem that usually is intimidating to people. So it's, you know, by the only way to make it less intimidating is to practice it. Okay, got it. So I'll flash it on the screen. But I do appreciate those questions, because that's intelligent question. Where am I? I'm in section 4.3, and I want to go back to 20. That's funny. I'm going backwards, but the problem gets harder. The chemist has three different acid solutions. The first acid solution contains 20% acid, the second 40% acid, the third 60% acid. He wants to use all three solutions to obtain a mixture of 60 liters containing 50% acid using twice as much of the 60% solution as the 40% solution. So even more words. How many liters of each solution should he use? Okay. This is what I need to do. Like the last time I thought to myself, okay, nickels, dimes, two unknowns, I need two equations. This time it's pretty much hit me right in the face that he's got three acid solutions and I need to find three variables. Acid one, acid two, acid three. Uh, acid starts with an A all three times. I could say A1, A2, A3, but why don't we just go back to traditional X, Y, Z. What do I want to know? Not the number of acid one. I want to know the liters, the number of liters of acid one, two, and three. Okay, so let's say number of liters of acid one, acid two, acid three. It is not silly to write this down like this. And in some sense, that is one of the things that protects you from creating bad equations, which is what Jacob was asking. You know, how do I know I got the equations right? 
So writing these things down makes you look at them and makes you double check how you're using these letters. Now let's look at it from a logical point of view. So when you talk about, oh, sorry, I gotta switch back to my paper. When you talk about Got that right? Yes, okay. When you talk about mixing things, when you talk about rate times time equals distance, when you talk about interest problems, there's a famous way to organize yourself. And that is, you say, I will organize myself in a table. And if you put all the information in a table correctly, in some ways, that almost does the problem for you. Almost, I said. So I've got acid one, I've got acid two, and I've got acid three. What is the important questions here? I made this too tight, I'm sorry. How many liters? I mean, that's important. How many liters of each do I have? But that's the part I don't know x, the y, the z. Each one of them is a different strength. You know, like one of them's strong, one of them's medium, one of them's not strong. We'll go back to the problem. But what, what that was, was that was the percentages. The 50% acid, I mean, the rest of it must be water, 50% water. Don't depend on me for any chemistry advice. But some of it is stronger than the other stuff. So in each liter of the acid mixtures, they have a different amount of pure acid. So let's call this, you know, what percent acid do we have? And if we have 10 liters, a 50% acid mixture, then the amount of acid present would be five liters. I could put this in this third column. 10 liters of 50% acid would be five liters of acid. 10 liters of 10% acid would be one liter of acid, and the other nine liters would be water or something, I guess. So now I need to fill in this column, say, what was the strength of these? So I go back to my problem. First acid solution is 20% acid. Remember, a percentage is 20% is 0 0.20. Remember, percent in English literally means per 100. So to say 20% means 20 parts per 100, 20 one hundredths, which is a decimal is 0 0.20. When you do the percentage problems, you always express percent as a decimal. Second one was 40%. Third one was 60%. So I'll go back to my paper. And now I know how much acid came from acid one. 0.20x. How much total acid came from acid two? Multiply these, 0 0.40y. How much total acid came from acid three? Multiply these, 0 0.60z. I haven't written any equations yet. <laughs> Maybe it's time I should write some equations. If I, well, where are the equations? I gotta go back to the problem. I haven't seen any equations yet. Uh, now I got to start to bring things out of the equations. Now there's this twice as much of this stuff. Okay, I got that. Wants to obtain a mixture of 60 liters containing 50% acid. Okay, so now I know the total number of liters, and that's actually important. 
the x plus y plus z must be 60. Let me write that down. Okay, that's one of my equations. I'll come back to my paper in a second. But I think I've just discovered that I need another row in my table. I need to think about the mixture. What should I think about the mixture? I want 60 liters. And that stuff should be how strong? 50% acid. Let me go back to the table. Paper, sorry. 60 liters total, 50% acid total. Now this time I don't need a variable. 60 times 0.5, one half. That means I want 30 liters of acid. There's another equation. Think about it. The total acid from all three of these has to add up to the total acid in the end. So now I've got 0.2x, 0.4y, 0.6z added together must be 30. Now I'll tell you, this makes for a pain of writing, and I don't like it. So I am about to change it. Let's think about it this way, just to show you the process. Let's go green. Nobody said go white. feel sorry for the Michigan people. Go blue. They're not smart enough to say go yellow or go maize. What, what is the other color? I don't know. No, I'm not slamming mix Michigan people. Do you see this 0.2x, 0.4y, 0.6z? There's nothing wrong with it. I just don't want to work in decimals, thinking decimals. Decimals are fractions. I hate fractions. Why don't I multiply everybody by 10 right now? 10 times 0.2 will be 2x. 10 times 0.4 will be 4y. 10 times 0.6 will be 6z. You understand, now I gotta do 10 times 30 too. That's 300. So do you understand what I did there? I just made it easier to look at. Okay, so far so good, but unless I come up with a third equation, I'm gonna just be swimming in the dark. So, Let's go back to the problem one more time. Third equation. Wants to obtain a mixture of 60 liters containing 50% acid. And then here's one more condition. Wants to use twice as much of the 60% stuff as the 40% stuff. I gotta go back to my paper. What's the 60% stuff? The Z. Twice as much 60% as 40%. What's the 40% stuff? The Y. Now say this out loud. Uh, I don't know if I shared that page with you. But that's what it said. I'll, I'll repeat it. He wants to use twice as much of the 60% as the 40%. Now that's an equation, but I got to write it carefully. And so this is a part where something could go wrong. Think like this. If he wants to use five gallons, well, liters, if he wants to use five liters of this, how much does Z have to be? 10 liters. If Y is 10, Z has to be 20. So that equation to me says this. Z equals 2Y. Whatever Y is, Z has to be twice as much. Now I'm going to rewrite that because it doesn't look like the others and I want to have this nice, neat table of equations. How can I rewrite it? Why don't I just subtract 2Y from both sides?
do you see what I've created? Three equations, three unknowns. I am hoping I created them correctly. I'll have to test somehow in the end. But, I'm go ahead, go ahead. So why would the two be on the Y side instead of the Z if he's using twice as much of the 60% solution? Good, and that's why I walked you through this word game. If you're using 10 liters of 40%, how many liters of 60% do you want? 20. If you use five of the 40%, how many 60%? 10. Good. If you use Y of the 40%, how many of the 60%? 2Z. Two, Two Y. 2y. Oh, I see. Whatever number I put here, I told you to double it. And then I said, oh, z equals 2y. That's why I had to say that. And it's very common to put the two on the wrong side. So you got to carefully think that one out. But this is right. If this is 10, this is 20. If this is five, this is 10. If this is 100, this is 200. Did I put the two on the right side? You gotta say with confidence, yes, you did. But it's not easy to write that with confidence. So you gotta practice that. But that's a great question. Now, in the end, we'll come back and see if it's right. But that is the trick in this problem, one of the tricks. Well, one trick is you gotta make a table, or at least the table helps. Second trick is, did you write this one correctly? Okay, good. Okay, so now I've got this nice, cool table of equations. That's interesting. Table of information, created table of equations. Now, before we take a break, I'm gonna cheat. And why don't I take these equations and go straight to the calculator? <laughs> One, two, zero. One, four, minus two. One, six, one. Sixty, three hundred, zero. These are the x's, y's, z's, and over here on the other side, the constants. I do not write an equal sign in there. I just, I put a little dashed line to remind myself those are the concepts. But here's a situation. And I don't mind if you do problems like this. I'm gonna do this thing by hand after the break. But how about this style? What if I did this in the calculator, wrote down the answer, then did it by hand? That is not cheating. Because then, I will know when I work it out by hand whether I got it right or not. And that's what I want. I want to know that I got it right. So let's stuff this in the calculator, read the answer, and then come back and see if we can actually do it. Okay. I'm putting this green matrix in the calculator. So I'm gonna get rid of this stuff on the screen. Second function, matrix. This time I want three rows and four columns. So I want a three by four. So I'm gonna edit A and turn it into a three by four. I could have used another matrix, but I don't need that other one. Now I got three rows and four columns. Now I'm gonna enter all these numbers. Left to right, top to bottom, just say, one, enter, one, enter, one, enter, 60, enter. Make sure you type them in the right place. And you could always arrow around if you have to go back and fix something. Okay, second row. Two, enter, four, enter, six, enter, 300, enter. You can do this quickly after you get used to it, but then of course that's dangerous. Last row, zero, enter, minus two, enter, one, enter, zero, enter. I look at this, I think I typed them incorrectly. I'm gonna bring them back by book so you can see the screen better. But I can also go back to my main screen and just ask the calculator to report what I did. 
remember? So quit. And now I want, since you asked good questions about calculator buttons, I want to remind you about these two buttons. Killer buttons down here. Entry and answer. Those two buttons will save me a lot of time. I'll show you. Because I got to go back here and type A, reduced real echelon form A, you know, button, button, button. Your finger is getting sick. But if I type entry, second function entry, remember I told you this once, I think that the calculator goes through the last things it's been doing. So second function entry. Oh, I'm going to use that. Second function entry. There's A. I didn't have to go find it. I just went back through the list of things I've been doing. In calculator language, that has a special word. It's called the stack, which is kind of from computer programming, the stack. So what is matrix A? Let me ask the calculator. Did I enter it correctly? Let me refer to my paper. This is not silly exercise I'm doing now. Make sure you entered it correctly. Okay, I entered it correctly. Now, let's do the reduced row echelon form. Oh, shoot, what button was that? What menu is that? Oh, that's a pain in the neck. But if I did it earlier today, I'll just go through the stack by hitting second function entry and then Uh, I hit enter. Now there's the answer, but I want, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm a relatively demanding person. I want you to read the answer to me. What is X? What is Y? What is Z? I just want to make sure you understand where I'm getting these numbers. X is what? Is it the number of uh, lead or leaders? Cool. Oh, the number of leaders of acid, but I mean, on this answer, I'm promising that this is the answer. Which number is the one that's the X? Oh, the six? Yes, that's what I want. Thank you, good. And the Y is what? 18. And the Z is? 36. And you hit a home run there. So just for everybody's benefit, I'll make sure everybody's on the same page. How did you know that those were the X, Y, Z? And you're right, and, but it's always hard, even when you, it's, it's funny that when you're, even when you're right about something, it's hard to explain it to someone. But how did you know that the six was the X? Um, Cause that was the first equation? This was the first column. <laughs> Literally, no, not that this is the first equation, but that this column, this first column was the X column, and that one represents one X. And this is the second column, that's the Y column. That represents, that one represents one Y. This is the Z column. That one represents one Z. So X is six, Y is 18, Z is 36. That's how you read it. When you wrote the letters in that order, that's how I wrote the letters in that order. Okay, writing on the calculator screen does not work. Okay, so now I just want to relax for a second. You need to stretch your legs too. But I'm willing to bet money that the answer to this problem is six liters of acid one, 18 liters of acid two, 36 liters of acid three. The question is, if we came back and did it, and we did it by hand, would we agree? And do we know how to check if we're right? But I'm, I'm telling you this calculator stuff, calculator trick, so you can know you're right before you start. You know, you've seen the t-shirt before, you know, my brother-in-law loves me and fish fear me or you know, any kind of t-shirt variety like that, right? You guys have seen those t-shirts? Oh, my, my attorney loves me and the Congress fears me. <laughs> I, whatever.
I want math problems to fear you. I want, or like wearing the t-shirt. I mean, math problems don't fear people. Fish don't fear people. They're just fish. I want you to have the confidence like the person that wears that shirt. And of course, the person that wears that shirt is doing it for a joke, and that's okay too. Math problems fear me, not the other way around. Not you fear math problems. I want you to be so good and to have so many weapons that math problems fear you. Okay, now I got 101. Let's come back at 106. And, you know, I can appreciate you like jokes, you don't like jokes. Let's make it 107. Frankly, I got to make jokes or else, you know, this whole situation would just be intimidating and boring. So if you want to say it that way, let me just make the jokes for my benefit, whether they entertain you or not. I'm going to mute my microphone and relax for a few minutes, stretch my legs. Let's come back at 107.
Okay, we're back. Missed it by a minute. Sorry about that. So uh, let's do this by hand. And remember, doing a three by three by hand is more work than doing a three by three. <laughs> okay, thank you for the applause. But it's not un unreasonable work. It's just work that we have to do in an organized way. And some people get trapped in three by three problems because what they do is they end, oh, I'm gonna get rid of this variable. Then I'm gonna get rid of this variable. Then I'm gonna get rid, and they go in circles. And so the number one thing I was trying to tell you last time was don't go in circles. Go with a plan, go with a strategy. So let's do it. So I'm gonna write this a little more compactly on this piece of paper so I can fit all the work on one piece of paper, but I got X plus Y plus Z equals 60, 2X plus 4Y plus 6Z equals 300, minus 2y plus z equals 0. And I'll call these equations 1, 2, and 3 as we did. And now what is the plan? Like the nickels and dimes, I'm good at 2 by 2s. I, I think I can do the 2 by 2s, Dave. So, what I want to do is take this three equations, three unknowns, and turn it into two equations, two unknowns. And actually, I'm already halfway there. Here's one equation with two unknowns. Could I create another equation with two unknowns? Now, what's the strategy? The strategy is, oh, I'm missing an x. So what should I do? Maybe I could get rid of that x, too. Then I would have equation with two equations, two unknowns. Not four and six because getting rid of this X might change these people, but that's okay. So now that I've decided on a strategy, I say, okay, how do I kill that X? I could add a minus two X to it. How could I create a minus two X? Let's take negative two times this row and dump it on that row. And once you say what you're going to do, then it becomes easier to do. But you gotta practice saying it and doing it. And I very carefully multiply everybody by minus two, which wasn't too hard in this equation, but if you got negative signs, you gotta respect them. And then I got this two X plus four Y plus six Z equals 300. And that's what I wanted when I add them, that there are no X's and that there are two Y's. Add these, I got two Y's total. Add these, I got four Z's total. And add 120 negative and 300 positive is 180. Oops, sorry. Now that's one equation with two unknowns. Remember last time we were just playing around, I called it equation A. If I needed another one, if I need to make an equation B, I'll do it. But thankfully, in a sense, this is already my equation B. So what's my strategy? Use one equation to kill the X's in another equation and then solve the remaining two by two. So now that I'm here, already I got my B. Now, this is my target. Now, I was trying to pick a harder problem. And right now this problem has fallen apart in front of me. I mean, it's just, it's being a little bit too nice to me, I think, but maybe the hard part was in the setup. What do I got? Two equations, two unknowns. And I like to eliminate X or Z or Y or Z, but the Ys are already eliminated. They're, they're ready to die. They're ready to go. All I got to do is, I don't have to change anybody. I'm just going to add these two equations. No Ys, five Zs, 
is 180. So it says to me that Z must be 180 divided by five. 150 is 30 fives, 30 more got six fives. So whatever you do, calculator, paper and pencil, I don't mind, slide rule. Abacus. Abacuses are kind of cool. 36. Now, again, I've emphasized that we could eliminate again, and we could eliminate again if we wanted to, but why don't we try it the way you guys suggested it last time too. If I know Z is 36, I could just go right back here. Either one, but I'll take this bottom one. Negative 2Y plus 36 is zero. I don't mind if you do it like this. Negative 2Y is negative 36. Y divide by negative two, divide by negative two. Don't tell me I got negative 18 liters of acid. I have 18 liters of acid. Don't screw up the minus signs. Sorry, I gotta always move the paper up. Okay, what do I got now? I got my Y is 18. I got my Z is 36. Why don't I take those two, get on the answer train, and go back up to the top. <laughs> now I'll find out what X is because Y is 18 and Z is 36. So X plus Y plus Z, putting them in carefully, if they had other modifier numbers or if they had negative numbers in front of them, I'd have to respect that. But the was X plus Y plus Z is equal to 60, right? So x plus 18 plus 36 is 60. And x plus 54 is 60. So x must be 6. Now don't just circle this and go home. Remember, we have to say the answer. So now I'm going to say the answer back here, which was two pages ago, you know. This is six, and this is 18, and this is 36. By the way, six times 1.2, or times 0.2 is 1.2. 18 times 0.4, oh, I gotta work this out, uh, 7.2. 36 times 0.6 is 21.6. If I add 6 and 18 and 36, it's time for the safety check. Is that 60? Yes. 24 plus 36 is 60. Now let's add the acid column. If I have 1.2 and 7.2, that's 8.4. And 8.4 plus 21.6 is that 30. Yes. What's the last check? The last check is did I use twice as much of this stuff as that stuff? The answer is yes. So this is how I answered Jacob's earlier question. How do I know I wrote the equations right? I have to check the answer. And do you see that in checking the answer, I did repeat the equations do the three things add up to 60? Check. Does the amount of acid add up to 30? Well, that was after I modified it by multiplying by 10, but that was check. And did I use twice as much Z as Y? The answer was check. Yes, I did. Okay, now I'm really comfortable. And now this is, you know, gravy time. Nobody gets paid to trot around the bases, right? Nobody paid Derek Jeter X billion dollars because he looked good while he was trotting around the bases. They paid Derek Jeter some ridiculous amount of money because he hit home runs and did other things. But right now we've already hit the home run. Ball is out of the park and now we're just rounding the bases, but we had to do it right. Because there's a rule in baseball, did you know that? that if you do not touch every base, you are out. 
you can hit the farthest home run you want. But as you're jogging around the bases, if you don't touch each base, the next ball that comes into play, the pitcher just throws it to that base, umpire rules you out, home run comes off the board. That's such a rule. So you got to touch every base. We got to touch every base right here. So what are we going to say? He used six liters of 20% acid. I don't think I left myself enough space. 18 liters of 40% acid. I have to extend my box. Uh, what? 36 liters of 50% acid. Okay, I, I made it a little too small, but but do you understand the analogy? We got the answer. We know we got the answer. It even matches what we got from the calculator. So I already know I hit a home run, but I got to finish it off. I've got to say the answer. I've got to touch every base. Okay, excellent. And I'm getting on here. This was page two. I'm just trying to keep things organized. This was page three, got it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back. And the calculator check works, so I'm happy about that. I have done more calculator problems. I've even in that last problem done a kind of intense problem. But I haven't told you really about the unusual or strange cases. So let me give you this example, and then we'll move on. Because right now, you, if you're getting lots of confidence, then you're saying what to yourself? Well, what could go wrong? You know, this seems, I think I can do this. What could go wrong? So you're always, you know, maybe you're a person who always has good luck. Maybe you're a person who doesn't always have good luck. I don't know. You're always asking yourself, what could go wrong? Okay. So I want to pick a particular problem out of the book. It looks harmless. So right now I'm searching the back of the book for harmless problems. And yes, 33 in section 4.1. No, not my favorite. 47 in section 4.1. I like that better. So let's do. I'll come back to one like 33, but uh, selection 4.1, number 47. So this is an example of what could go wrong, but, uh, but I shouldn't say it like that because not anything we're gonna do wrong and we're gonna solve the problem. What I should say is this is an example that happens to you rarely, but you better be ready for it. And it could be that you've even done this before. So maybe when I write it on the paper, you'll say, oh yeah, that, I know that one. That's, the, that's a crazy one. Okay, so here's the instructions. The instructions say, solve the system. And they never write down in the book, first equation, second equation. That's just my habit. I like to do that, stay organized. And we know how we're gonna do it too. We're gonna eliminate variables. I'm gonna use the addition method. So what I'm gonna say here is four and eight. I think I could easily get rid of the X's. Of course, I could easily get rid of the Y's too. But let's just try to have 
two times this equation, not one, add it to equation two. So two times equation one plus equation two. And so I'm gonna do two times one and then equation two and add them. Two times equation one is eight X minus six Y equals minus 14. Respect the minus sign. Equation two is minus eight X plus six Y equals minus 11. And so I accomplished my mission. I did get rid of the X's. Uh, good, 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 thank you. I didn't see this as you said that, but you are right. And it, it, so I missed one of the bases. 36 liters of 60% acid, thank you. Okay, so now the question in your mind is, if I had wrote that, well, how many points would you take off? I don't know, a 10 point question. The worst, if you made a statement like that, I might dock you one point, but I might not dock you at all. Because I see all the documentation that you did things right, but it is sloppy of me to miss that. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so back here, gonna kill the X's. I think I've done it. Add the X column, no X's. Of course, add the Y column and there's no Y's. So now I'm feeling very nervous. But if I add over here, I get negative 25. It's like, what, what? There's, no, there's nothing here to work with. Or if you want me to do it legally, zero plus zero is 25, negative. And now I'm getting like, what, what? So, what do I got to say about this? I've done absolutely nothing wrong. That's your first response when you come up with something like this. Oh shoot, I must have screwed up. No, you've done nothing wrong. But you do have to know what does this mean? So I'll tell you. You did everything right, and you came up with zero equals minus 25. Now that's clearly false. No one thinks that that's good. That's false, that's bad, it's impossible. It's not true, you, whatever word you wanna use. So what does that mean? Think about it. What it means in the end, remember what solve means. Solve means find the numbers that make both sentences true. Can you find me a point that lives on both of those lines. And what I've done is come up with a statement that's impossible. So what I've discovered is that there are no points that live on both of those lines. Now in math language, the way you say that is, there is no solution. So are those lines parallel then? And that's the conclusion. They must be. What are the only two lines in the universe that never touch? They must be parallel. So there's no solution. And what is so sweet is that all we got to do, pull out the calculator, or got to give equal time to Desmos. And let's just type those into Desmos is to see 4x minus 3y. This is the kind of thing that I use computers to do. This is the kind of thing I want you to use computers and calculators to do. What should you use them to do? You should use them to check if you're right. There you go. I, I, they don't cross. They must be parallel. You're right. They must be parallel. That's why they don't cross. Now I feel better. You said that we could use um, Desmos on our written homework, right? To like show. Uh, that's good. And, and thank you for that question because I've been reading your homeworks that you handed on Tuesday. And 
And the, and the answer is yes, but I'm going to say provisional yes. So okay. yes, I do want you to use that, and I don't mind if you hand in the image. I okay. want you, though, to be able to draw the lines by hand. So it was my intention in this previous assignment for you to draw them physically by hand. Some people hand it in Desmos graph. Now, since I didn't say draw by hand, I got to take it. Okay. If you read the problem, it said draw. But, and, and I could be obnoxious and say, I said draw, you draw. No, so that I gotta say, I gotta work on my communication, right? So okay. say it like this, absolutely any day, every problem, you can use Desmos in the calculator. But when the problem will say, show me how to do this or draw by hand, then you will draw by hand. So I'm not going to say anybody who turned in Desmos on, a on this week's is not right. You were right. So for that one, you would want us to do that by hand, though? Are you talking about the problem on our paper right now? Um, no, like for the homework we turned, that was due last night. I intended for you to draw them by hand, but I'm not going to oh, okay. anybody. I should have said draw by hand. Okay. So this is not important. I just remember well, you saying that we could um, sometimes turn in the Desmo graph instead oh, yes. of yes, yes. I I don't I don't even think that's wrong. In fact, if you okay. drew it by hand and then turn in the Desmo graph, you would just be saying, "See, I'm right." Right. So, so you could do it like that, but but I just want to say, do be prepared that you have to draw something by hand. Okay. Yeah. So that is a very good question because I noticed that on some papers. Okay. So perfect. Now let me do another one like that. So uh, here, I'm, I'm not gonna pick a problem out of the book. I'm gonna just make one up right here because that's sufficient. What if I had said solve the system and I say, uh, 4x plus 6y equals minus 6x minus 9y equals, and this is, I'm trying to think not how to screw this up. This is 12 and this is minus 18. Now, by the way, you're already warned that I'm trying to do something tricky or sneaky, right? Because otherwise I would have, obviously I said, hmm, I'm gonna pick these numbers because this is what I want. But up here, you could have had that feeling too. And that's why it was important that you made that observation. These lines had the same slope. Actually, if you were to solve these lines for y, you would have found out that they both had a slope of four thirds. And that's what made them parallel. Sorry. Now, could I have known that they had the same slope without solving for y? Actually, yes, because they both had a four to three ratio. But that's not enough. They both had a four to three ratio with one minus sign. So I should have been suspicious that something was odd here because then when they had the same ratio, that made both the variables die at the same time. Now let's go down here. Here's four to six. Here's six to nine. Two plus signs, two minus signs. What ratio do these both have? Do two you see three. that? Two to three, that's right. Two to three, they both have the same two to three ratio. In fact, if you went and found their slopes, they would both have a slope of minus two thirds. Now, why is that minus sign there? Because I gotta subtract and divide. Even this has a ratio of two to three. Now, if that would have been a one plus sign, it would not have a ratio of two to three anymore because it, it would have a ratio of two to minus three, which is different than two to three. Okay, so now you're suspicious that something's wrong, but you don't just pop off and say, okay, no solution, I'm done. No, you're gonna actually execute. 
And so what I'm gonna do is take three times equation one, and two times equation two. Three times equation one is 12 X's plus 18 Y's equals 36. Equation two times two is minus 12 X's minus 18 Y's. Ooh, something bad's happening. But minus 36. Now it's true that something odd happens. I did kill the X's. Thank you. I also killed the Y's. So the whole left hand side is zero, but there's a difference from the last time. Because this time, the right side is zero too. And this is no longer false. I can't just say no solution, it's not true, because this is true. So again, the question is. Would it be infinite solutions? Yes, and that's one way I want you to say it, and I want you, but I also want you to say one more way, but that's a common way to say it. People say infinitely many solutions, but what I want you to do is tell me why there are infinitely many solutions. It's because they're the same line. Good. Or some people get fancy and say the lines coincide. It, it doesn't matter which way you say it. What does this mean? These two lines are the same. Now, but if someone asked me for an answer, that is how I would have to answer. There are infinitely many solutions. But some people want you to go farther and say, well, tell me what they are. For example, let me, let me show you this. There are infinitely many solutions. That means that these are the same line. Now let me graph the line because they're not so threatening. If x is three and y is zero, that's one of the intercepts. If y is two and x is zero, that's the other intercept. So I could do the same thing with equation number two, but I've already decided that they're the same line. So here's what I don't want you to say. Be careful. Do not say all numbers or all real numbers or all pairs. That's not true. There are infinitely many answers, but they're all on this line. This point is not going to work. If I pick a point off those, it's not going to fit in either one. So the proper language is to say there are infinitely many solutions. Or if you want to get really fancy, and the book does this in a way so you might see it on your homework problems, computer problems, that's why I'm warning you. You could say something like this. And in English, this is a special math notation, but in English it says, all the points x and y such that 4x plus 6y equals 12. Or you could solve for y and say it like that. All the points x and y such that y is, now I'll have to go and solve this for y, minus 2 thirds x plus 2. So this other thing I'm writing here is like a fancier way, a more complete way. A lot of people would be satisfied with all infinitely many solutions, but the book does write the answers like this. Check the back of the book. So I'm guessing he's going to make you do that in the uh, uh, computer homework too. So do you realize? So these are the bad cases. The things things go wrong, but things didn't go wrong. All what I should say is. These are the rare cases. What do I mean by rare? You know, like if I throw two pens on the table, they're gonna cross. 
And I could do that a thousand times. And I think they're gonna cross every time. I might actually throw two pens on the table one day. And they land like that and they stop moving. But it's possible. And these will be parallel lines that don't cross. In your homework problems, it's more than possible. He sprinkles in several of those. I have never thrown two lines, I've, excuse me, I've never thrown two pens on the paper and had them land like that. I've been doing this for 25 years. I have never thrown two pens on the paper and make them land like that. Maybe someday they will. To balance like that, that would be crazy. That's what I mean by rare. These things happen, parallel lines, they don't happen ordinarily if you just pick lines at random, but be prepared. Okay, now you're prepared. Okay, got it. Now I wanna just introduce one thing and then, you know, we're having a good time, time-wise. Uh, we're not in a rush, but I just wanna label this paper so I can post it later, paper four. Got it, got rid of that, got rid of that. Okay, so uh, I got all this different graph paper. Uh, someday I'll show you around the basement here. It's not very exciting. I mean, you've seen the whiteboard. You've seen the document camera and the reflection off my calculator. I also, because we've been doing this for six, seven months, I also have a stack of paper next to my desk that's about 10 inches high of scrap paper that I've just wasted because I've been writing in front of a camera for six months. And I'm trying to use the second sides of the paper. That's why I'm mentioning it. I'm trying not to, I'm trying to like not waste paper. Okay. So that's why I just filter through odd sheets of paper sometime. What's a polynomial? A polynomial is a breed of horse. No, that's a palomino. A polynomial. A day before, on Tuesday, I kind of teased you and said it was like these linear equations. It's not really like them, but it's like them in a way. Think about the linear equations like this. Because that is a linear equation. It's all the things you can make up if you just use single variables. No squares, no cubes, no multiplying x times y. Just straight up single variable. Number times variable, number times variable, number, just that's it. You know, 3a minus 2b plus 6c equals 12. That's a linear equation too. I don't have to use x, y, z. I don't have to use any, I can use any letter I want. But polynomial says, What if we started using powers of the variables? Or you could say products. Products means multiplying variables. I squeezed that in too far. So the difference between a linear equation and polynomial is really kind of short. Let me write down a polynomial. That's a polynomial. Looks a little bit like that linear equation, except now a couple things are different. It's not uh, an equation. 
But if I cross out the equal six, that's not an equation either. The, the reason it's a polynomial is because I have included something that wasn't allowed in the linear equations, and that's the x squared. Or I could say this, minus 3x squared y plus 2xy minus 3y, 3x plus y squared minus 7. I could just go nuts. And I could make an equation out of it. Very interesting thing. Now, now, by the way, remember I said to you, equations are graphs and graphs are equations. So look at 3x squared minus 2x equals 6. If I made an equation out of that, I wonder what graph it would be. I'm going to go back to Desmos just for kicks. Wouldn't it be interesting if you, your career was to do math just for kicks? Because I can't complain. It's fun to do math. Uh, okay, it's a graph. 3x squared minus 2x equals 6. It is a graph. Okay, it's a graph. It doesn't look like an interesting graph. Let me zoom out. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what Desmos is doing here. Let me ask the question differently. What if I told Desmos to graph? y equals 3x squared plus 6. Oh, that's more interesting. That's a parabola. This other one that I just wrote on the paper, which is completely crazy, minus 3x squared. I just want to see. I might, you know, I might get nothing. But I want to see what happens. If I type all these things in 2xy minus 3x plus y squared minus 7y equals 0. And you go, whoa. I don't know. I'm going to have to, I can't, it's hard to blow that up, but. Are you joking? Is that a parabola and a squiggle? This thing that I wrote down, the minus 3x squared y plus 2xy minus 3x plus y squared minus 7y, that's the part that I call a polynomial. And so I'm asking you the question, what happens if we allow the powers to come in? You know what happens if you just have 3x plus 2y equals 6. It's a line. You like drawing them, you enjoy drawing them, you get good at drawing them, but after a while, what do you think about lines? After you've drawn a lot of them, and I hope you get to this place, you think what? Okay, yawn, it's another line. Of course, you want to draw it right. But what would happen if you allowed multiplying x times y? What would you happen if you allowed powers of x or y? I did not personally expect this. Uh, but let me change the scale on y. Let's go down to 50. See, that's funny. I, I seem to have, although I won't make a commitment, I seem to have a parabola part and a wiggle part. Let me zoom in on the wiggle part. You know, just go minus five to five, minus five to five. And that's great as far as looking at the wiggle, but then I miss sight of this parabola up here. Okay, this is not what we're doing right now. But I wanna put in your mind that every equation is a graph and every graph is an equation. But let's forget about the equals part. Let's just look at this thing. 
This thing is called a polynomial. What happens when you allow squaring and multiplying of the variables? Now, why is it called a polynomial? So we're just gonna wrap up here. A polynomial is, this is the fancy math explanation. A linear combination, sorry, it just means a string of, a linear combination of products and powers of variables. So this is a polynomial. It's just a really short combination. In fact, maybe you've heard these words before. This is called a monomial. Mono, I forget whether this is Greek or Latin. Don't know either one. Mono means one, one piece. Polynomial, many pieces. Monomial, one piece. Uh, of course, now you can guess what happens if I say this. This is two pieces, so it's probably called a binomial. This is three pieces. So it's called a trinomial. And I don't want you to worry. After this, they stop trying to make up names. There's no, if it's got four pieces, nobody calls it a quadrinomial. So don't worry about it. After, after three pieces, they just give up and say, polynomial, many pieces. <laughs> but each one of these, if, if you want to call these polynomials, that's fine. They're all polynomials. Now here's what you don't allow because what's important is can you recognize something and if you want to learn how to recognize something like you know poisonous snakes what do you want to do you want to recognize which snakes are poisonous and you want to recognize which snakes are not poisonous because it's important that you know the difference uh, king snake coral snake there's a famous way to recognize those two. Does anybody know it? Isn't it like the colors are opposite? Like the stripes? There's a silly poem. That's right. It, there's <laughs> the colors. It, does anybody know that silly poem? No. <laughs> They're both red, black, and yellow. But this is the key. Both of these snakes are red, black, and yellow. But the poem goes red on black, Friend of Jack, red on yellow, beware fellow. Does anyone know that poem? You ever heard that? Red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow, beware fellow. Because a coral snake is very poisonous and the yellow bands and the red bands touch. King snake is actually useful. Well, they're all snakes are useful. King snake is actually non threatening, not poisonous. And the red band and the black band touch. Go look it up. Red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow, be wearful. So what's important to me is not that you just know what a polynomial is, but not that you also know what it's not. When you do a polynomial, you are not allowed to divide by a variable. This was doing very good until I divided by X. As soon as I divide by X, that ruins it. Now, if I cover that up, that's a polynomial. It's a binomial, a linear combination of products and powers of the variables. But I did not allow dividing by variables, no dividing. Some of you, okay, oh, I've seen this movie before. Isn't that three times X to the minus one? You are correct. You can write three divided by x is three times x to the minus one. It's an exponent rule, and we'll talk about it later. But I have to qualify it then. 
non-negative powers. You say, if you meant that, you should have said that. Well, you're right. So linear combinations of products and non-negative powers of X and Y. You say, what about this seven? That's not a power of X. Oh, yes, it is. Seven times X to the zero, and zero is not negative. I don't want to get too crazy legal on you, but the things that are not polynomials, no square roots, no X divided by Y, no X to the power Y, no, no, no. Polynomials are just combinations of products and powers, positive or zero powers of variables. Now for that, that's about all we need to do right now, but I'll give you one more common sense rule. What if I told you to add What if I told you to add those two people? Because this is just get you started on your homework. Well, you've heard this phrase before, and, and you'd probably do it even if you were never trained. And the phrase I'm searching for is combine like terms. So I can add these people as long as I only add people that belong together. For example, if I got three horses and three horses, now I got six horses. So I got six of these X squared, sorry, X cubed puppies. Uh, I have two X squared and then I'm gonna subtract two X. They don't go together. I don't say I got zero somethings. No, I just take them with me. I got two X squareds. I'm gonna subtract two X's, the seven, Okay, it's sitting there, seven plus zero is seven. So we're gonna to start to play with these things called polynomials. And one of the key commands or instructions is always combine like terms. Don't add things together unless they have the same variable and exponent. They don't belong together, apples and oranges. Don't add apples and oranges. Okay, so here we are, I mean, the real mission was for you to understand linear equations and be very good at using your calculator and using that addition or elimination method. We're going to spend a chapter in polynomials. And this was just a tiny introduction. So we've got a lot more to do here. So don't, you know, we got to call it a day now. Okay, you guys relax. You have a good weekend. I gave you two systems of linear equations to solve in your next written homework. One of them is a two by two, but it's obnoxious. Problem with numbers that are crazy. So you gotta concentrate. And the other one, if you look at it, I told you I was a fan of the Lakers. The other one is three equations, three unknowns. No, it's four equations, four unknowns. And it's not, there's no problem like that in the book at all. So I just thought I'd have fun. I'd give you four equations, four unknowns. Don't look at it as something that's too big or I've never seen it before. I can't do it. Just use your logic. Uh, when I said twice as much acid as this acid, that's a hint because there's going to be stuff like that in this problem. Go and find it. Now, I was talking about the point scored by LeBron James, Daryl Green. I forgot the players I named, but I picked four players off the Lakers, the points they scored in their uh, series wrap up against, who are they playing? See, they're gone, so I don't remember them. Anyway, you go look up the score in the paper and find out how many points LeBron James scored. Can you do the problem? That's what I want to know. Okay, you guys have a good day and go outside and enjoy the nice fall leaves. <laughs>